epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Romans. To the Romans, the Apostle Paul, he wrote a, a letter that we call an epistle. An epistle, not an epistle, but an epistle. Everybody say epistle. An epistle is a doctrine content letter that the Apostle Paul wrote between 56 and 60 A.D. of the Common Era. We're talking about 2,000 years ago that the Apostle Paul wrote this great letter to the church uh, at Rome. Anybody been to Rome, you know what a massive city that is. They call it the Eternal City. It's a beautiful city. And um, there was a, a group of Christians there that were meeting in different homes. And we're talking about cells. Pastor Josh was talking about our cell group ministry here at the church. And it's awesome to have cells outside of the church itself, particularly for friends and family and neighbors that, you know, they may be uncomfortable with coming into a church experience. You know, many people have questions about the church and uh, questions about religion, and they associate religion with the church in many ways uh, mistakenly. Um, be that as it may, uh, there were several house churches that developed in the city of Rome after Claudius Caesar expelled all the Jews and all the Jewish Christians from Rome in 48 A.D., 48 A.D., he expelled all the Christians and the Jewish Christians from Rome because there was a big argument between the Christian Jews and the Jews themselves over Christ in their synagogues. And there was a few synagogues in Rome at that time in Transtibere, uh, the other side of the Tiber River. It's a great Jewish community to this day that dates back to the first century A.D., well, in that community, you know that in the book of Acts, we read about all the Christians that came to Pentecost, all the people that came to Pentecost, excuse me, non-Christians, Jews and Gentiles alike, from all over the empire. And um, if you read the book of Acts in that account in chapter 1 and 2, you, you'll read that the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles as they were in the upper room praying. And they came down from the upper room speaking in other tongues that were heard by the different nationalities of Jews that were there to celebrate Pentecost in Jerusalem that year. And it says that Peter came down and Peter began to preach to the multitude and 3,000 people gave their heart to Jesus in one day. You know, it's exciting when someone gives their heart to Jesus. It's even more exciting when a man gives his heart to Jesus. No offense, women. But it's even more exciting when a Jew gives their hearts to Jesus. I hate to put it this way, but one Jew giving their hearts to Jesus is equivalent to a hundred Gentiles giving their heart to Jesus. That's how hard it is to have Jews come to know Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Well, they all went back to their different countries after the festival at Pentecost, especially the 3,000 that were saved. So um, scholars assume, and we have some evidence, that many of those that returned to their countries returned to Rome, Christians from Rome. Rome is mentioned in that list of people that came from other countries and received Christ at Pentecost. Are you tracking with me? We need to set up the historical and social background of the scripture in many occasions in order, to, in order to understand what the Bible is saying. And so these Jewish Christians that gave their heart to Jesus in that Pentecost festival in Jerusalem after Peter preached returned to Rome to their synagogues. They had no other place to meet. There was no such thing as the church as we know it today. The only place that they could meet at was a synagogue where they heard the law and where they heard preaching on the law and the prophets. So the Jewish Christians who had just accepted Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah went back to their synagogue in Rome 
And the debate began. Is Jesus of Nazareth really the Messiah of Jewish expectation? Is he really the Son of God? And of course, the Christians who were at Pentecost met other Christians who were still alive, who had walked with Jesus after his mighty resurrection from the dead, talked with the resurrected Jesus, ate with the resurrected Jesus, touched the resurrected Jesus, and walked with the resurrected Jesus. Because the resurrected Jesus from the dead had over 500 witnesses that saw and talked with him after he arose from the dead, which is historical and legal proof that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. Now, don't ask for scientific proof that Jesus rose from the dead because the scientific methodology doesn't work with that type of evidence. Is that clear? That's really wrongheaded and stupid for you to try to apply the scientific method to the resurrection. It's like prove to me that you have a great, 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 great grandfather. Well, I, I, I can't prove it, but I know I did. Well, prove it scientifically, well, I can't. But you could prove it legally and historically by records. And here we have a record of over 500 people that walked and talked with a man that was raised from the dead. So the cornerstone of Christian faith is this. There's one man who, by the power of God, violated the laws of physics turned upside down the second law of thermodynamics and proved that this universe is not on a way to a cold state called death. This universe has received new life beginning with the resurrection of one man who violated death itself because of his sinless life. So now... The Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church at Rome. What happened here is that when the Christian Jews went back to discuss that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah that Jews have been waiting for, it was a big argument between the Jews who said it wasn't and the Jews that said it was. Is everybody listening to me so far? Pay attention. We're getting to the Bible. And don't leave here saying he didn't read the Bible, therefore it's not a Bible church. This is a Bible church. The deal is that there was a split in the synagogues. You follow me? The Romans had already expelled all the Jews for cantankerous fussiness about dietary and health regulations. Can you believe it? They were so fussy that in 19 AD, they were expelled from Rome. Thousands of them were expelled from Rome because the rumor was that they they purposefully hurt baby boys in a bloody ritual at the eighth day of their birth, which was inhuman for the Romans and the Greeks. Well, of course, that's circumcision. So they kicked them all out. So it wasn't the first time that they've been expelled from Rome for fussiness. Is everybody listening to me? They were expelled from Rome by Claudius for five years. So the Christian Jews like Priscilla and Aquila, Andronicus, Junia, and all the names that are listed in Romans chapter 16 that Paul had not ever seen in Rome, because he had never been there when he wrote this letter. All those Christians were expelled from Rome. Claudius died, and Nero became the emperor, and relaxed the edict of the expulsion, mentioned by a great historian named Suetonius in his 25th volume on Claudius Caesar. When the edict was relaxed, all the Jews, including the Jewish Christians, came flooding back to Rome. Well, guess what happened? Before the expulsion, when the Christians came back from Pentecost, the new Jewish Christians, other Gentiles gave their heart to Jesus, like you and me. 
Mexicans, half breeds, whatever we are, half this, half that, you know, cafe con leche, with or without sugar, whatever your kids are. They came back and they found that during those five years that all the Jews were gone, now there was different churches that were established by Gentile Christians, not Jews, because there was nobody there at the synagogues to worship the law or the prophets or God. So there was a new style of church that the Jewish Christians came back to find called the church in houses and the church as we know it. Because the Jews left the service to us. We open in prayer, we sing in worship, we take up an offering, we preach, we copied that. The Jews, we didn't copy it, they gave that to us. Are you paying attention? Okay? So they came back and found this. So now you have Christian Jews and, and, and Christian Jews and Gentile Christians together in one church. The problem was when everybody had fellowship and everybody brought their potluck. The Gentiles, of course, we brought carnitas. The Jews, they brought lamb and vegetables. And for them, it's a sin, even though they're Christians, it was a sin to eat pork. So big debates began in the church. And so Paul writes this letter, and basically he's saying what Rodney King said, can't we all just get along? And then he explains in this book how to get along now that we're all Christians. What's more important? What's not that important? Uh, did Christ die for all of us? Did Peter have a vision where God said, Peter, take any animal that you have in this sheet because it's all been cleaned by the blood of Jesus. Right? And even though lobsters crawl on the seafloor, they're still so good to eat. Anyway, just to set up this, and now we're going to read out of Romans. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to read from Romans 1 through 17. Chapter 1 of Romans, verses 1 through 17. Are we there? Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. The word bondservant, of course, is doulos in Greek, and it means slave. Bondservant is a namby-pamby word. It's a euphemism for the word slave. Okay? We don't like the word slave today because of our history in the United States of America with that wretched uh, philosophy of slave ownership. Um, but there's some lessons we can learn from that. And that is that um, we are all slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. And he says, you do this, and what do we do? Whatever he says, right? God says, you do this, and we do that. Because we're slaves. Is there any here that's a slave to Jesus? I'm a slave to Jesus. I, 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 I'll be a slave of that master. He has your best in mind. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called by God. I'm going to add a few words here and there, okay? Called by God to be an apostle, okay? An apostle is someone that's sent, separated to the gospel of God which he promised before through his holy prophets in the word of God, the Holy Scripture. An apostle that was sent with a particular message concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You got to get that clear right there. If anybody if, has a question and says, who is the son of God? Jesus is the son of God. And how do you know he's the son of God? Because he was raised powerfully in the resurrection from the dead. Nobody has ever been raised from the dead. He's the first one. Everybody clear? God did for him what vitamins will never do to you. Everybody's trying to find a cure for death. It's been found. And it's happened already. And it's going to happen again. The first one to be raised from the dead was Jesus of Nazareth 2,000 years ago. And how do we know he's the son of God? Because he's the only one raised from the dead so far. Is that clear? 
Man, you're going to explain to me how Jesus comes to be the son of God. Don't get into an argument about that. It's useless. Arguments are useless. A life that's dedicated to Christ, that can do more than an argument for someone that has questions about Jesus. Is everybody following along? How do we know that he's the son of God? Because he was raised with power. And the word right there, power, is dunamis in Greek, which means dynamite. Now, verse 5, through him we have received grace. Right? Everybody know what grace is? Unmerited favor. Everybody say unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. In other words, somebody did you a favor that I did not deserve, that you did not deserve. We don't deserve to have God to forgive our sins. But God forgave our sins when we didn't deserve him to forgive our sins. Is that cool? That's called grace. Grace is when you're nice to somebody that don't deserve it. Right? That's grace. Many of us don't have grace. You do, okay, you did that to me? Okay, here's what I'm going to do to you. Somebody listening to me? Well, we like to get even, don't we? And God loves to forgive. We just don't push him. Through him we have received grace and apostleship. So Paul's talking about himself as having received a particular calling. And his calling is for the obedience to the faith. Everybody say obedience to faith. Among all nations for his name. All nations, not just Jews. All nations. God just didn't come to save Jews. God came to save everybody that will believe in Jesus Christ as his son. Among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace, shalom, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome that somebody can speak on behalf of God? You know, whenever you have to say something to someone that's true in the spirit of God, you're speaking for Christ. Don't be bashful to speak for Christ if what you're saying is true and genuine and good. You follow me? Don't be bashful. I like to say, you know, on behalf of Jesus Church today, on behalf of Jesus, let me say good morning to you. From your pastor who has a connection with Christ. I speak on behalf of my father and his son and the Holy Spirit. Bearing witness. He goes, for I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. That you, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Isn't that cool? That, that even though Paul had never been there, yet the, the, the reputation of the Christians at Rome was worldwide. Like Mission Ebenezer, your reputation is worldwide for, be, for, 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 for remembering people in Miami and Puerto Rico and Mexico, for remembering them for the offering, the mighty $30,000 that we raised and for the stuff that's coming in and it's already been planned out by Pastor Josh and we're taking a mighty love offering from this church to the churches in Houston, Texas. Your reputation, church, as generous is going way beyond. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Notice the important words popping up here, church. Gospel. We've heard that word up up at the front. Remember that he was separated to the gospel of God. Now the word gospel in the Greek is euangelion. Everybody say euangelion. And that word means good news for the good news. What's the good news? That when we were sinners, God forgave us. And now we're free of all our sin and condemnation. And we could live with a clean conscience for God. And our name is written in the book of life. And you have eternal life and all the privileges and benefits thereunto signed. Isn't it nice to know that you love Jesus and there's peace now between you and God? Notice I didn't say peace in your home. Now people say, oh, ever since I came to Jesus, I have no more problems. That's when your problems start. 
That's when they start. But guess what? Isn't it nice to know that you got somebody really, really big walking with you in that problem? <laughs> you got Hercules. You got Jesus. You got God walking with you through your problem. You know, it's better to walk with God and face your problems than face your problems by yourself. Life will crush you. People jumping off bridges because they can't handle their problems. People taking their life. People taking drugs because they can't handle their problems. You know what I mean? I'm serious. Life is serious. It gets real bad without Jesus. It gets real bad without God. You know, God, Jesus coming in your life doesn't mean that your problems will go away, honestly. I'm going to tell you the gospel truth, right? But you'll receive strength to face them. You'll receive courage to handle them. You'll receive peace from God while you go through them like the, the young lady was saying here during worship. You know, you took around at the world that we live in and there's fear all over the place. You know, people are afraid of, well, I'm going to build an a atomic bomb shelter in my backyard. I was going to build a pool. But, and somebody said, I'm going to cover my pool and make that the shelter. You know what? I wouldn't even worry about it. The worst thing that ever happened to this world and the best thing was that the only good man to ever live died on the cross of Calvary to wash your sins away. The worst thing that could happen was that a good man was crucified. And the best thing that happened was that he did. I'm glad he did. Like Andre Crouch is just saying, I'm so glad he did. What I couldn't do for myself, what you can't do for yourself, which is wash your sins away. Jesus did free of charge at the cross so that you could apprehend that and get a hold of that rope that extends to you from, from the cross to the present. There's a big rope. Get a hold of that rope and hang on. Get a hold of the rope of salvation. Get a hold of the rope of justification. Get a hold of the rope of acquittal. You have been acquitted at the cross of your sins and your past and my past and my sins. I've been declared righteous by the judge. The judge. You know what the judge did? The judge stepped down off of his throne in the courthouse, walked down to the bailiff and paid for my bail. The judge did it. The judge forgave you. The judge forgave me. The judge acquitted you. You're innocent even though you're not. You're innocent not because you're innocent, because you've been acquitted of the crime. We've been declared righteous. Look, look what it says in verse 16. For the wrath of God, excuse me, verse 16. For I am not ashamed now of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in the gospel, the good news of what Jesus did at the cross, the righteousness of God has been revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by their faith. Now, you, some of you didn't get it. Some of you just saying, woo because it sounded good. You say, woo, pastor's on today. No, no, no. Let, let's say, ooh, because we know what it means. Church, we know what it means. What does it mean? It means that something happened 2,000 years ago outside the walls of Jerusalem. The only good man, the only, sac the only proper sacrifice in the history of religions and the history of tribal anthropology that has sought sacrifice from the Nordic tribes of Sweden and Norway, down to the Aztecs, down to the Chinese and the Africans sacrificing for thousands and thousands of years, and still they keep sacrificing because their sacrifices cannot take their sins away because we know it because they had to sacrifice again. And the Jews had a sacrificial cult and they had to sacrifice every month, every year to try to get their sins away. But then God prepared himself a lamb from the foundations of the earth without a blemish separated for the sins of mankind and he died on the cross of Calvary as the ultimate and last sacrifice the only one needed to satisfy the righteous need of a God that's just to take away the sins of the world his name was Jesus and he's the only and last sacrifice to be made and it was efficacious to propitiate and expiate our sins from ourselves by faith in him our sins have been removed. No more sacrifices needed. 
No more. Is that clear? The only perfect man, God required a perfect man to undo what a perfect man named Adam undid. What Adam did to bring sin into the world, Jesus undid by dying on the cross. Don't ask me why God required it, but God is God. All I know, it's been done. And all I know is if you're a sinner today, if you're carrying a burden of sin, if you're carrying a sack of sin, no matter how many votive offerings you light at your local church, no matter how much you try to save yourself by sacrificing and, and doing good works and trying to please God, nothing you do is going to please God as much as what was done by his son at the cross. You can't add to it or take away from it. Everybody clear on that? It's been done. You and I are acquitted from sin once and for all. Hapax legomena. Once and for all, you have been declared innocent, even though we're not. And guess what? The judge bailed you out. Ooh, Lord, this is getting exciting. So what, what does this word, what does this word justify? Right there where it says in Romans 1, 17, for in it, for in what? For in the gospel. And what's the gospel? The gospel is this, the good news and when we were sinners, God provided a sacrifice and a gift for us in Jesus Christ our Lord, who died on the cross to remove the sins of the world. So you could actually say the whole world has been forgiven. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor, does that mean that, I mean that uh, Kim Yock and our president, uh, they've been, yeah, they've been forgiven. But if you don't appropriate that forgiveness, by faith in Jesus, as God's gift to you, the forgiveness has not been enacted. The acquittal has not been enacted. The declarations of righteousness has not been enacted. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's imagine that from the cross, there's 10 trillion ropes stretching out from the cross into the year 2017. The forgiveness has happened. Everybody listening to me? But not for you unless you get a hold of it. Everybody listening to me? Unless you get a hold of it by faith and trust in Jesus as my Savior, it's not yours. It comes by simple faith saying, yes, I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior that he forgave my sins. I trust you, God, that he's my Savior. And you get a hold of that and don't let it go. Have you got a hold of it yet? Have you got a hold of Jesus yet? Because somebody here hasn't got a hold of Jesus yet. You're kind of slapping around the rope. I mean, if you're drowning, are you going to slap around your life rope? No, man, you're going to get a hold of it. If you're drowning in our sins and we're driving in burdens. We're drowning in problems. We're drowning in habits. We're drowning in, in hate and in pride and racism and prejudice. We're drowning all that. You know what I mean? You're going to drown completely unless you snap up that rope. And hang on to the rope. Somebody said, Pastor, you mean that since he died on the cross, we're all forgiven? And, and if, when I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven forever? Being that I can't lose my salvation? Let me, let me explain it to you how it is. First, you buy a car. That's a nice car, ain't it? You're driving down the freeway. Man, wow, did you see the new Lexus? That's a pretty car you got there, brother. How much did your Mercedes cost? Such and such and so. But I really love your car. It runs really well, man. But what do you got to do to keep that Lexus running? Everybody pay attention. Anybody here have a car? Did you walk here or did you drive here? One way or another, you, you, you drove here or you was driven here? Right? But if you want to keep that car running, right, what do you got to do to the car? Polish it? Polish the rims like a good Chicano. <laughs> well, you got to do your car if you want to keep that sucker running. Man, you got to change what? The oil. And every now and then you got to check what? The transmission. And every now and then you got to check your fluids. And every now and then if you hear a little creak or something, you got to take it into the dealer and have them look under the car. Maybe you need a lube job. 
uh, every now and then, you got to make sure that, you know, you're filling your tank up when it says half, because if you fill it every time it's empty, you're going to get to sludge in your gas filter, and it's going to go out, and it's going to leave you on the 405. In other words, you can get a hold of your salvation, but you better maintain it. Right? Because if you don't maintain it, what's going to happen to that car? It's going to break down. The same thing with being saved and asking Jesus to come in your heart. You need oil. That means you got to come to church and receive the oil of anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life. You need to check your transmission. That means you need to read your Bible. Is everybody listening to me? You need to pray. You need to check that tire pressure. Right? So in other words, there's things that we need to do that are practical to maintain what God has done for us. One, read your Bible. Two, come faithfully to church to hear the word. Three, pray. Four, take communion. Take communion. This communion reminds us of the decision that we made. That the man that poured out his blood did not pour it out in vain. And that the man whose body was broken was broken for you and for me, for our healing and our shalom. Once again, I'll end it with this for in the gospel, in the good news, the righteousness of God, that is, that he forgave our sins, even though we don't deserve it, is revealed. Finally, it was shown to Paul that it wasn't just by keeping the law and by being good that we're getting to heaven. The only people that are going to get to heaven are the people that trust and have faith in God's Son as Lord and Savior and that have been declared righteous by that faith in Him, by Father God, that God has acquitted you just simply by having faith in Jesus and having it every day. So may you live and may I live in the grace of God.